This story is about Jiro's family, who just moved into a new house. The couple also had a lovely and obedient little daughter named Anna. While her mother was busy moving stuff, little Anna enjoyed jumping and running around. Then she opened the window to see what was outside. It seemed that the scenery outside did not disappoint Anna. A cool and gentle breeze blew in. It excited her, so she called her mother. Hearing her call, Yuki ran to her. The scenery behind was beautiful, just like what the family desired for so long. The pond behind the house refreshed the air. Jiro's family even planned to breed some fish in that pond. However, Anna was curious and asked her mother why no creature existed in that pond. Yuki couldn't really explain. She pulled Anna inside to help tidy things up in time for dinner. But it didn't stop there. An incident happened to their family on the first night in their new home. At midnight, Anna started twitching. She had a pale face and was sweating profusely. The little girl suddenly had a high fever. Seeing Anna's appearance, Yuri was extremely worried. Anna's condition became worse and worse. She began to tremble and breathe strenuously. Seeing this, Jiro and Yuri hurried to get a thick blanket to cover her body, but it didn't get any better. Yuri was so worried that she could not sit still. Looking at her child with such a high fever, it creeped her out. Suddenly, Anna woke up, but her condition was still very bad. Not only that, she also seemed very panicked. Anna, after waking up, got into Yuri's lap and hugged her tight. Her small arms clutched her mother's shoulders fearfully. After a while, when she was more settled, Anna stammered out a few words. But Yuri didn't really know what her fear was. She then gently reassured her child's safety. The little girl was in her mother's arms, taking a deep breath and then pointed at the wall. According to Anna, she saw a man and a woman standing just next to the closet. Their faces were swollen and disfigured, as if they had been immersed in water for a long time. Their looks were terrifying. Jiro and Yuri looked towards the closet, but did not see a single figure. Anna was hallucinating, wasn't she? Although they could not see anything, both Jiro and his wife had a bad feeling about this. Feeling like something was wrong, Jiro then told his wife to take care of his daughter and he would go outside to get something. After saying this, Jiro rushed outside with some kind of plan. Just a few minutes later, he came back and in his hand was a large knife and a wooden cutting board. According to Jiro, when he was a child in the neighborhood, there were many children like Anna, who always said that they could see ghosts. And the grandparents would use a large knife and a cutting board to make noise. This would drive away those souls every time. While making noise, Jiro also shouted loudly, asking the ghosts to leave his house and let go of their daughter. Yuri watched her husband's actions, hoping everything would be fine. Thinking that this new house had a problem, the next morning Yuri called her mother to help. Anna's grandmother saw her current condition and was also very surprised. However, before coming here, she also invited a feng shui master to help. The feng shui master looked around the house. He said the house currently had a strong miasmatic atmosphere and that the lake behind the house was the most serious problem. Anna's grandmother also told him in more detail about the two ghosts that Anna saw last night. Listening to the appearance of the ghosts soaked in water, his gut told him to ask everyone to go to the back of the lake. Arriving at the lake, they did not see what the master was looking at, but his face immediately went sharp, frowning and looking panicked. It seemed like he saw what Anna saw last night. 
On the pond's surface now floated two extremely scary ghosts. Because he was used to seeing ghosts, the feng shui master could still remain calm. He just slowly turned his back and walked like nothing happened. Anna's grandma and Yuri saw the expression of the master and were very curious. But when they tried to ask, he just kept silent and said nothing. After coming back in the house, the master still refused to say a word, only carefully inspecting the wall next to the closet. Even the mold on the wall was very carefully examined by him. Jiro and Yuri also saw these stains when they moved in. Finally, after a long silence, the master said that he saw a man and a woman above the lake earlier. After listening, Yuri and her mother-in-law immediately panicked. They did not expect that about the water pond in the backyard. Also, they did not expect their long-time dream home to have such a terrifying secret. Not only did the two souls still live there, but they also wanted a child. And Anna was the one that the other two spirits were aiming for. According to the master, the only way to now help Anna is to get out of their sight. He advised them to make a paper dummy to deceive the two spirits. That night, following his instructions, Yuri bought a dummy that looked exactly like her daughter to the edge of the pond. First, she burned some votive papers. She silently pleaded to beg the two souls to liberate and spare her family. When the flame got bigger, Yuri threw the prepared paper dummy in. Then she began to beg, hoping that the two spirits would accept the child she had sent to them and let go of Anna. Yuri's request just stopped. The fire instantly grew louder, burning the dummy. It seemed the devotion of the mother had been accepted by the two souls. After doing exactly what the feng shui master told her, Yuri got up and went back to the house. The fire was still burning, but it was getting smaller. Beside the fire was water, and it suddenly moved in a vortex that grew bigger and bigger. Yuri could hear the water, but she just glanced without daring to turn back. On the pond surface were the two spirits. They were holding the hand of a little girl and walking away. In front of the window where the pond can be seen, now stood a mirror. And because of the mirror, Anna had not seen the two spirits again. A few days later, after hearing the news about Yuri's family, all the neighbors came over to visit. Just like what the feng shui master said, the two souls were a couple. But their families forbade they be together. So they committed suicide. There were many people who moved in here, but all of them had to move out within three days because of their harassment. To be sure, Yuri sewed a curtain placed in the window where the pond could be seen. And since then, nothing weird happened to their family anymore. I have an uncle named Ben, who is my father's third brother. The story I'm about to tell you is also related to him, a man who is extremely addicted to gambling. After losing his job, Uncle Ben couldn't find work. Every night he would go to the casino and try to make a living by this so-called profession. My aunt always tried to stop him, but she never could. In those days, she took care of everything alone. She took care of the whole family and two small children. My uncle just gambled. He played ten times and lost nine times. The family's assets were gone. There was a day when Uncle Ben didn't come home for two days. My aunt didn't go to look for him because that wasn't the first time. On the third night, my uncle returned my aunt guessed that he only came home because he lost all his money again. But this time, 
His face was proud. He took out more than 50 million from his pocket and gave it to her and said it was all for her. This proved that he won. He finally won. It was the first time my aunt saw this and more importantly, my uncle promised never to lose again. He also proudly told her about how he won this game. Yesterday, he played Mahjong with some people. He would first lose continuously. All his money was lost, everything, and the people in the casino would kick him out and wouldn't let him play anymore. But even though he begged for the casino to let him continue playing, he was still punished and banned. As he was standing in the hallway cursing, someone called his name from behind. The man told my uncle that maybe he should try praying to the God of Fortune. Maybe then he would win. My uncle didn't show any interest in this. He did not believe in any God. He would sometimes consider praying to different gods, but no God ever helped him to win in gambling. The man continued to persuade my uncle, saying that ordinary begging would not be effective. This made my uncle a little curious. He needed to know where to pray to get this effect on him. The man offered to drive my uncle to the place where he could pray to that god. So the two of them went straight and deep into the forest. They crossed a large tree path to a small statue. The stone statue, placed neatly in the forest, was also covered with a red scarf on its head. The man showed my uncle how to pray. He needed to use his hair and nails, as well as blood, to make prayers work for this god. My uncle found it strange, but he still wanted to try it because he had nothing to lose. And after thinking about it, my uncle decided to pull out some of his hair. He took some hair and nails, as well as blood, and placed it in a bowl in front of the god statue as an offering. After that, he clasped his hands in prayers, and he would pray that he could win every bet he made. As soon as the prayer ended, the wind blew across the statue. That caused the veil to fly off. When the strong winds blew away the veil to reveal the statue's damaged and fierce face, my uncle became scared. He thought maybe he should not have prayed to this statue or altar at all. After leaving, he went back to the casino to borrow money from others to try his luck once again. True to the promise of the stranger and the prayer he made, he won every single bet he made. The amount of money earned was too much to handle. Once my uncle bet 10 times and won 9 times, no longer as unlucky as before. But every time he won, he would start feeling tired and he would start panting like he had just run three kilometers. He coughed for many days. My aunt advised him to stop gambling, but he still did not listen to her. Every time he came home from gambling, he would bring back a lot of money, which surprised her. But in terms of health, he was not as good as the night before. In just two weeks, my uncle lost weight, went from 80 kilograms to only 65. Seeing such an unusual transformation made my aunt worry. She cared about him a lot. She knew he was hiding something from her, but she couldn't convince him to tell her because he thought he had to earn a few billion more before he stopped. The next day, even though he was not feeling well, he still decided to continue to go to the casino to play. My uncle kept winning and winning and he collected a lot of money. But in the fifth game, another player won. My uncle then struggled to breathe. He tried to scream but fell over through the table. It seemed he was having a heart attack. Everyone was shocked. Someone called the ambulance to take him to the hospital. However, he sadly passed away even before the ambulance arrived. My aunt received the bad news and she rushed to the hospital. 
She cried bitterly because she couldn't say goodbye to him for the last time. He was gone. In just one month, my uncle had lost nearly 20 kilograms before his passing and his health seemed to be declining rapidly. My aunt suspected something was off and asked the doctor for an autopsy. When the results came back, she was shocked, for the cause of death could not be determined, nor could the doctor explain anything in a scientific way. My aunt was shunned by her husband's death. She suspected that his death was related to some evil deity. So she decided to go to the spiritual place in the forest to find out. When she arrived at the forest following the instructions of a few people, she looked everywhere but couldn't find any statues or altars. It's been three long years since my uncle had died, yet his death still remains a mystery that has made my aunt and our family extremely heartbroken and sad. During my summer vacation that year, my parents allowed me to go to my grandmother's house to play, although my father stated that he would miss me greatly. But I knew that this was primarily due to my parents' desire to have some free time together without my presence in the house. My grandmother's house was built in the typical village style and it brought back many memories for me every time I visited her. I might say that I loved being here, especially playing with the neighborhood kids. I also made a lot of friends here. We could play ball and many other folk games together every day. Our favorite game was hide and seek, and it was through this game that I learned of a terrible incident that occurred when I was 8 years old. We were all playing hide and seek at the time. I was the first person in the seeking role and other boys had been seeking for a spot to hide very carefully, which was quite difficult to discover. Toro was the first one I found in the haystack. He might have been too sluggish to get away, because where he hid was very near to me. Then I glanced around and realized there might be someone lurking behind the abandoned stage adjacent to the wall, an abandoned stage that very few people dared to approach. I was on my way there when Toro stopped me and warned me not to go since no one dared to hide there. That area was really scary. I assumed he was attempting to conceal the boys who were hiding there, so I disregarded him and walked onto the stage to begin looking. There was a tiny tunnel between the stage and the rear wall and I expected someone to hide there when I arrived, but there was no one there which disappointed me. And in the end, I was mistaken. There was nothing but a pile of rubbish right there. Hiding in this location might cause you respiratory diseases. Don't look here since no one dares to hide here. Toru came near the stage and ordered me to rush down since I couldn't locate anyone and had to listen to him. I didn't understand what happened before or why Toru was so concerned when he spotted me climbing there. I didn't trust him when he said the stage was haunted since I thought he was just trying to terrify me. To persuade me, he followed me and proceeded to terrify me more, claiming that spirits would be singing on the stage at night. And it looked like it was true. I went to Toro's house all day to play with him, and we spent the entire day watching cartoons until his mother informed us that it was dark. So I had to rush back. Otherwise, my grandma would be worried for me. Toro sent me to the door and after saying my goodbyes, I crept back home. The village road at night was quite empty, with just a few lampposts with very weak light. I walked alone. The sound of footfall was very distinct, making me a bit scared. While strolling, I was listening to the sound of someone singing. The sound sounded extremely weird and mysterious. I turned my head and found myself right next to the stage 
where I visited this morning. The stage was filled with singing sounds, yet there was nothing on it. I wasn't sure who was singing on the other side of the stage, so out of curiosity I strolled to the stage where the singing and music attracted me. As I came closer, I noticed two people on the stage dressed in dramatic play actors costumes. There was a masked face actor with a glossy paint job and they were playing an ancient Three Kingdoms play that I had seen on television. They performed, sang, danced and were visually appealing to spectators. I didn't really understand what those two artists were performing but it was fascinating to see them sing and act. When the performance was finished, both actors on stage came to a halt and stared at me. The masked man charged at me putting out his hand and beckoning, tugging my hand to join them on the stage. I could see his mask well now, and it was looking extremely sharp. Without any sense of danger, I willingly stretched out and was about to wrap the hand that was dragging me in front of my eyes. Someone touched me on the shoulder just as I was going to place my hand on that hand, which made me jump. I turned around and saw a neighbor who lived near my grandmother's house asking why I didn't return home because it was late and that I looked like I wanted to climb on the stage. I mentioned that there were two artists on stage and I wanted to show him. But as I turned back, there was no one on the stage and the man was astounded as well because there was nothing in front of us. The man was exceedingly concerned and drew me home immediately. I turned to gaze in the direction of the stage again before leaving, since I didn't think I was mistaken. However, now that the stage was entirely empty, the silence made me shudder. When I arrived home, the neighbor informed my grandma about the event. My grandma was also well versed in the history of that stage. She couldn't help but be worried for me. I didn't believe I was in any danger. I couldn't say I was terrified because the two artists didn't do anything to me. But I did find it humorous. But grandma took the situation seriously. So I asked her whether the two actors on stage were ghosts. My grandma groaned and explained that in the countryside, People said that even if you were fortunate to survive, bad luck might strike at any time if you encountered those spirits. I was intrigued at the moment, so I asked my grandma to tell me the tale of that period. My grandma didn't think twice before telling me. That stage was there many years ago. And those two artists were also members of the local band. People always invited them to sing at New Year's Eve, weddings and funerals to express their condolences or share joy with the family. On one lovely day, wicked fascist troops were on their way to patrol the village, came across two artists who were practicing a play. They used guns to coerce them into singing a song they liked and then performing for them for entertainment. Those troops listened intently and clapped. They summoned these two artists to serve the general many times. They were later accused of being traitors to the motherland after the country was freed. Unfortunately, the two performers were executed on the same stage in the end. Both were shot dead without trial or the chance to claim innocence. There were tales that the stage was haunted by them since they died unjustly, unable to flee. Many individuals in the hamlet would be in danger if they heard someone singing on stage late at night. Surely awful things would happen to them. And many individuals perished on the stage, some by hanging inside some by swallowing poisons, and all were implicated in the deaths of those two performers. 
My grandmother remarked that my destiny was unfortunate since, but unlike others, I was discovered and brought home by my neighbor. Otherwise, I might have been in danger. I shattered my arm that year. I wasn't sure whether it was what my grandma said, because I'd heard and seen them. So calamity had struck on me. It was also the last time I was allowed to return to my hometown and live with her. Perhaps the recollection of that haunting stage and her narrative would always be a fascinating memory in my life. It was something I witnessed many years ago that I still wonder about today and have found no explanation for it. When I was little, my parents would take me to a restaurant near my house and eat many dishes that I liked every weekend night. Then the whole family would walk home together. That day, we also went out to eat as usual. On the way back from the restaurant, I suddenly needed to urinate. At this moment, I caught a glimpse of my parents looking at each other. It seemed they didn't want me to have a pee here. At that time, I thought that my parents worried about me when I was alone because it was relatively dark and the village roads were solitary. But because I couldn't take it anymore, they agreed. After that, my father warned me not to go too far from them and hurry back as soon as I finished. Hearing that, I was also a little annoyed because I often ran in the morning on this road. It was not strange. Why were my parents so worried? But that thought also quickly disappeared and I went to find a place to deal with my need. After that, I turned into a small alley to pee and my parents stood outside on the main road waiting for me. At that time, I was young so I didn't know anything to be afraid of. I just wanted to deal with my need quickly and return home, so I picked a wall and started peeing. I felt so comfortable. I quickly pulled up my pants and adjusted my clothes to prepare to return to my parents. However, there was a noise from the end of the dark alley when I was about to turn around. It made me stop. It sounded like footsteps, but it sounded so loud and messy. It didn't seem like the footsteps of only one person. I thought to myself that who would walk in this dark alley at this hour? After that, the footsteps got closer and closer to me. It was the footsteps of many people. They walked very quickly and unevenly. The footsteps were very heavy, creating a loud noise that reverberated throughout the alley. I kept staring at where the footsteps came from to see who they were. A moment later, the shadow of three tall men slowly passed before my eyes, but it was too dark to see their figures. But I suddenly felt that something was wrong because their faces were strange. Although I couldn't see it clearly, I was sure it wasn't the face of an ordinary person, which surprised and intrigued me. So I no longer cared that my parents were waiting outside, but it hurriedly followed these strange people to see where they were going. At that time, I didn't know if it was because I was young, so I was running slowly or because they were going fast, but for a moment I couldn't see them anymore. I didn't know why, but I still tried to run to the end of the alley and hide behind the wall. I finally saw those three strangers. They were doing something very shady and stealthy. I was curious, so I silently watched. But what made me more curious was that the faces of the three of them were wearing red masks, which looked very strange. They looked like demons, 
with large white eyes and two pointed fangs sticking out from the outside. They stood in front of an old looking house, then moved closer as if wanting to go inside. But what happened next terrified me. As soon as three strangers approached the door, they suddenly disappeared. At that time, I was so scared and couldn't believe my eyes. I almost wanted to scream out of panic and amazement. But then, for some reason, I tried to calm myself and silently continued to watch in front of that house because I thought for sure they would come back out. And indeed, it was just a moment later from the void, they suddenly appeared again, holding something in their hands. I strained my eyes to see clearly what was in their hands and why it was taken from this house. Then that thing made me even more terrified. In their hands were three human heads. I still remembered the scene vividly. Apparently of a man, a woman and a child. Blood was still dripping from those heads to the ground a lot. After witnessing that scene, I could only cover my mouth with my hand for fear. If I made a sound, they would probably kill me. I was so scared that I just wanted to cry out loud. My tears were also waiting to flow. Looking at those evil faces made me panic even more, wondering who they were. After that, they passed me by. They still didn't seem to notice me. Those people held three heads in their hands slowly left and disappeared into the alley. I was still in shock, so my body couldn't move anymore. I just stood there and watched those people until they gradually disappeared. At that time, I thought I was hallucinating. As a ten-year-old child, I had no understanding of such spiritual or demonic matters. My parents saw that I had been gone for too long, so they worriedly went to find me. When I heard my parents call, it was like I came back to my senses. I quickly told my parents a story from earlier because I thought someone must have been murdered in that house. But of course, my parents didn't believe me. They thought I was making up stories or had hallucinations because it was too dark. So I got angry and insisted that I had seen it with my own eyes. I also mentioned that I saw strange people wearing red demon masks and they went into the house and killed the people inside. Seeing that, my parents still did not believe me. I hurried to the front door where the three strange people were standing earlier. My own eyes saw the blood dripping on the ground. I was sure the blood was still there, so I wanted to show it to my parents. But when both of my parents arrived, they started to look at me with even more suspicion, which confused me. Because right now, there wasn't a single trace of murder on the ground. The ground was completely devoid of any blood. My father still wanted to believe me, so he tried to go to the door to check. If what I said was true, the door would have an intruder sign. But when my father came to check the door, it was still intact, with no signs of tampering. So I got scolded by my mother because they thought I had gone out and lied about the devil. After that, Although I was upset, I had no way to prove my words, so I had to regretfully follow my parents home, listening to them nagging along the way. In the days that followed, I seemed to forget about the strange incident, until one day the village suddenly became noisy, as if something serious was happening. People flocked to see a lot of people. I was also curious to see if it turned out that the house I saw that night was having a big deal going on. The people in the village were also very bewildered. I heard that all three people in the family had just died last night due to eating poisonous mushrooms, but only were discovered this morning. To this day, I didn't know if that family's death had anything to do with what I saw the night before. Later, when I found out about the mask, as far as I knew, it had the same shape as a ghoul. According to Japanese beliefs, Ghouls could come and capture the souls of the living, but what the truth was, I couldn't be quite sure.
This story is about a real estate agent named Higo. Today he had an important meeting with a wealthy landlord. The landlord rushed to greet him as soon as he entered the house and thoughtfully poured tea to invite him. Higo approached him shyly and inquired briefly about the mansion. Two people talked about the contract and the commission agreement as well as the selling price. Despite the fact that the decision had been made, the owner seemed to be depressed. Higo didn't pay much attention to that. The only thing he was concerned with was the profit that he would earn. He presented the owner with a completed contract and waited for response. Meanwhile, the mood in the living room had deteriorated. Higo felt a shivering sensation all of a sudden. The door to the living room burst open when he turned back slightly to have a look. He inquired innocently of the landlord about the state of the facilities, infrastructure and quality of this villa in order to conduct an evaluation, but the owner was unconcerned, simply stating that he was willing to sell at whatever price Higo deemed reasonable. Higo was taken aback by this. Suddenly, he heard a strange sound outside of the corridor. Before Higo could ask what was going on, the landlord handed him the contract and explained what needed to be revised before asking when he could resume signing. Higo received the contract, carefully memorized the customer's request and then quickly left. The owner also sent him to the door. On the way to the door, he noticed cold air coming from this house as if something strange was going on. Apparently, he had a feeling that this landlord was concealing something from him. He moved his gaze to a small corner of the living room. Some old toys for children had been left in the corner. Higo found it difficult to comprehend. But then he set aside the story about this house and strolled out leisurely. A cold breeze blew lightly on his back as he approached the gate. Higo had the impression that someone was staring at him. He then turned his head to look again at that house. When he turned around, there was a tiny shadow standing at the upper window. The face appeared of a little boy with dark eyes and pale skin. Higo looked at him with surprise, sensing that something was wrong. The landlord told him that he didn't have a wife or child. How come there was a boy standing there? But he soon discovered that his concern was futile. So Higo walked straight to the gate to continue his work, where the boy silently watched him. It was strange that he had just left the villa not long ago. The landlord called him back with a very urgent attitude, demanding that he wanted to conclude the contract as soon as possible. Higo returned to the villa for his client. He stood in front of the house and gently rang the bell, but it took a long time for the old landlord to respond. He had been waiting outside for a long time. He banged on the door and shouted loudly because his instincts told him that something bad had happened, but it didn't work. He discovered that the door was not locked while knocking. He pushed in curiously, wondering where this old man could go. Why the landlord didn't lock the door if he went out? Back into the room he heard painful groans of the landlord calling his name. The landlord appeared covered in blood in front of him. Something slashed across his back and he was running to Higo in fear, looking for help. He landed on Higo's body. Higo picked up the old man reflexively, asking him what had just happened. The old man hummed, extreme panic said that someone wanted to kill him. Higo had a chance to look behind the landlord when he fell on him, but it was a lot stranger than he thought. Behind him was an empty room with no one, no footprints and no indication that anyone other than the owner was present. He panicked and rushed the old man to the hospital. Fortunately, the injury was minor and he regained consciousness within a few minutes. His entire body was wrapped in white bandages and tired eyes stared at him. When Higo asked him about the incident, his eyes revealed a little sadness and remorse. The old landlord called Higo to stand closer to him and then sorrowfully told him the whole story, beginning with a bad decision he made a year ago. He was a failed businessman at that time. 
The company was on the verge of bankruptcy. All of the projects he invested in had failed completely that he ended up empty-handed. During a drink with a friend, he was tipped away to save the business, a very useful trick he picked up while traveling in Thailand. That was to invite Kuman Tong to worship in his home. The infant demon was a dread fetal body that was placed in a statue, then cast a spell to calm the soul so that it could stay in this world to save and bless the adoptee who was considered to be his biological parents. Because he was poor and stuck at the time, he listened to his friend and traveled to Thailand to request a statue of an infant demon to worship at home. At the beginning, everything came true. The devil provided him with whatever he desired. Money kept pouring into his pocket. His previous partners had rejected him before, now also back to collaboration. Some time later he met a beautiful young woman. The two quickly married. Not long after that the wife became pregnant. The doctor on the ultrasound said it was a healthy boy. During the pregnancy the wife always had a feeling of something very insecure, especially when she passed the altar of the devil that he placed in the house. One time the wife was passing by the altar of the Kumantang. She slightly looked up at the altar. In a sudden she saw the demon's face changed, staring at her. She told her husband about this, but he not only didn't care, he also considered it as a joke. Because she couldn't sleep, the wife went down to the stairs alone as if someone made her do it. Just a few steps, a great force behind her slammed into her back. Panicked, she turned her head to see what was standing behind her. She saw the infant demon standing on the stairs, looking at her, killing sight in his eyes. She fell down the stairs, slamming her body into the ground. She was unconscious and bleeding profusely. After that, she not only couldn't keep the pregnancy, but she also lost her ability to become pregnant again. The couple started to fight from there. He couldn't hold on to that broken marriage any longer, so he watched her leave the house with a suitcase. Since then, his career had also taken a downward turn. Losing his wife and family was devastating enough that he was unable to maintain his career. To cope with his grief, he turned to alcohol. Until one day, when he returned home drunk, he looked at the Kumantong statue on the altar and became enraged. He blamed Kumantong for his life being ruined and stuck, so he raised his hand intending to smash the bottle of wine on the demon's head in order to destroy the statue, but a ray of turquoise light shot at him before he could do anything. He slammed the bottle of wine onto his head instead. Blood splattered and his head hurt like hell. He regained his composure looking around Gidley, not understanding anything. When he looked up at the altar, he noticed that the Kumantong had transformed and now was staring at him with a soft ghostly smile. Until today, he decided to stay at home and called Higo in order to discuss about the selling of this house. Huh? While he was speaking, a sharp knife from the table rushed towards him. He was fortunate to avoid the knife's tip, but the knife cut him deeply on one of his cheeks. He unconsciously looked up at the roof and noticed the Kumantong floating in the air. That demon was staring at him. His eyes were white and wide open and he had a hostile expression on his face. The demon then cast a spell that caused his furniture to fly up and then threw him like a storm, rendering him unable to dodge. Higo felt panicked after hearing the story and worried about the contract with his landlord. He said his goodbyes to the landlord and then left quietly. He kept thinking about the horror story he had just heard as he drove. He walked past a mansion that was once thought to be a big catch for him. He couldn't help but be concerned when he saw the billboard in front of the house. Ego paused for a moment before taking a step closer. The infant demon was still looking at him from above. 
right at the window, but his smile had become more ghostly than ever. This story happened in Longan district, Huludao city, Lyoning province on December 10, 2015. I was working at a harbour there at the time. My colleagues and I lived together in the dormitory not far from the harbour. There was an abandoned building next to our dormitory. One day the three of us had a little drink after work. Yin, the bravest of the three, came up with the idea that we would explore the abandoned building. He said that the abandoned building used to be the office of a large company. Normally we would object, but because we were drunk that day, the ghost somehow made the two of us follow Yin. But when we got there, we both regretted it. If the building looked somber during the day, it was even scarier at night. Another colleague of mine was Sam who was not very big but very brave. Sam wanted us to go back, however, despite Yin's ridicule and irony that Sam was a coward, Sam still decided to continue, and I didn't have any opinions of my own. Although I was a little scared, I didn't fall far behind when the two of them were walking. After entering the abandoned building, we realized that there was indeed a fire before and there were traces of smoke everywhere. It was very dark inside the house. We relied on the light from the mobile phone in Yin's hand to shine, looked at some of the rooms inside, but were quite disappointed. The rooms were empty, they seemed to have been cleaned up after the fire, but nothing was left. At this point we decided to go out. Yin was thinking about something. He saw several houses in front of him that did not appear to be on fire. He also saw some items that were kept and asked to check them out. There were indeed some things in the rooms, but they were all shabby furniture that hadn't been used in years. There was a smaller corridor in front of some rooms. We decided to go down that road. Sam convinced us to come back, but Yin ignored him and Sam didn't dare to go out alone so he had to follow. At the door of a room Yin suddenly stopped as if something inside caught his attention. Sam and I followed Yin together and looked inside. We saw a person in the corner sleeping with a tattered duvet looking like a homeless person. But slowly we all discovered something was wrong. The person didn't show any reaction, especially the bare feet with a dead grey colour. Yin felt curious and wanted to go ahead and see if the person was alive or dead. I'll see if the person is dead or not, Yin said. Don't be so crazy, I tried to stop him. We both convinced Yin not to check that person because we might get in trouble, but Yin had a very stubborn character. The more we tried to stop him, the more he wanted to do it. Finally, he stepped forward and opened the tattoo duvet. This moment made our hearts feel like jumping out because no one knew if it was a corpse or a living person. But as soon as the duvet was opened, we were all scared. It was a dead wanderer. The body was rotting. It could be seen that he had been dead for some time. His skin was dry and disfigured. Seeing the horrible appearance of the corpse, Sam went to the back and vomited in disgust. I also hid far away, not daring to look directly. But Yin was brave, not afraid at all, mocking us for cowardice. Not only did he not leave, he even ran to the corpse and asked Sam to take a photo of him with the corpse. At first, Sam disagreed, but seeing Yin's appearance as if he wouldn't leave, he didn't take a photo. Sam had no choice but to take a photo for him. Yin didn't stop and he asked to take a few more pictures before leaving in the end. Yin was completely satisfied and we hurried back to the dormitory. Honestly, when I arrived there I wasn't so scared. 
But now that I knew there was a dead man in the building behind our dormitory, I was so scared. The way back became very scary. I always felt that there were ghosts following me. Fortunately, we all made it home safely. The thrilling adventure of the night had ended safely. After the horrible night last night, we all went to work as usual. At noon, Sam suddenly panicked and ran into my office with a panicked face. He said that Yin didn't come to work this morning. His phone was unreachable. Yin was keeping a piece of material that Sam was in urgent need of right now. Sam was very thoughtful, feeling that this must have been something to do with what happened last night. He asked me to go with him to the abandoned building. Ever since we saw the dead man last night, we had been terrified of this abandoned building. But I found Yin and it was daytime, so we still dared to come here. Following memory, we followed the path we took last night and began to look for Yin. Honestly, I didn't know why. Even during the day, this building looked so dark and spooky. The two of us took the road that we went on last night. Soon we reached the dead wanderer room and we looked inside, trembling. We immediately saw the tattered duvet covering the dead, but we also realized that it was different from last night. The overhanging shape of the duvet obviously didn't cover one more person and a bad premonition arose in both of us. Although Sam was very scared, he and Yin were both from the same hometown and knew each other before. He was worried about Yin, so he dared to remove the torn tattered duvet. But as soon as we opened it, we were both completely dumbfounded. Sure enough, Yin was already dead under the duvet. He died next to the rotting corpse of the Wanderer. No one knew why Yin came here or how he died. Sam and I couldn't imagine anything anymore. Later, the police came to handle the body and concluded that Yin died of sudden heart failure. But Sam and I understood that Yin's death stemmed from a lack of respect for the deceased. This scary story revolves around a man named Kiba. For a long time Kiba never believed in ghosts, until one day when he ended up encountering one. Being haunted by the ghost, he decided to see a therapist to have his condition checked out. As the two had finally met, Kiba pointed at a black umbrella at a corner of the house to the therapist, then told him it was spooky. The young male therapist couldn't hide the curiosity on his face. He asked Kiba how the man could be scared by a small umbrella like that. Kiba breathed deeply. He lit a cigarette and then told the young man about an incident that happened to him a few days before. That day Kiba had an overnight trip. He had to drive through a rugged forest which was rumored to be haunted and mysterious. As he drove to the forest, all of a sudden, he saw an old lady standing in the middle of the road, blocking his way. Kiba couldn't hold his anger as he tilted the window and loudly held at her. But the woman didn't have a look of fear on her face. She chillingly turned around, looked Kiba in the eyes and asked if he had seen her daughter. The mysterious lady continued to bombard Kiba with questions, then hurriedly ran away, leaving him totally confused. 
As Kiba finally composed himself, he continued with his shipment. As he made his way out of the forest, he stopped his truck by a grocery store. It was already morning. The store owner was very nice to him. He lit a cigarette for Kiba, then asked him about the trip. As they were chatting, Kiba saw a familiar figure from afar. It was the old lady who Kiba had previously encountered on the road. The shop owner said a tragic incident had caused the old woman to be mentally unstable. Kiba's curiosity was satisfied as he finally understood why she was acting bizarrely. Kiba then told the owner about their previous encounter. He even asked the man to tell him what had exactly happened to her. But the man's face instantly changed color. He extinguished his cigarette, refusing to tell Kiba the story. The man told Kiba to be extremely careful passing through the forest, then hurriedly got inside the store. As Kiba rarely had an overnight trip like this one, he decided to go sightseeing way until it was late at night, then began to go home. That night, it was pouring with rain, yet Kiba still cheerfully sang while driving his truck on the road. As Kiba nearly got out of the forest, he saw a woman holding a black umbrella walking in the rain. As he came closer to the woman, he realized she was carrying a baby that seemed to be sick. He stopped the car and asked them. It turned out that they were heading to the hospital. The woman asked Kiba if he could give them a lift to the place. Since Kiba was a kind person, he agreed to help them. Kiba opened the door for the two to get in. Then he gave them a towel to dry themselves off. Since Kiba was new here, he asked a woman to show him the way to the nearest hospital. The woman showed Kiba the way to the hospital. The car kept rolling on the road under the heavy rain. Thirty minutes later, they finally arrived at the hospital gate. Kiba instantly breathed a sigh of relief. He got out of the truck and opened the door for the two. The woman expressed her gratitude to Kiba then walked away. Tom wasn't in a hurry to leave soon as he stood there looking at the two until he no longer saw them. Later, Kiba got on his truck, only to find out that the woman had forgotten her black umbrella. As he stuck his head out of the window, hey! something bizarre immediately caught his attention. The woman was still there to be seen with her sickened son, but somehow they faded in and out of view. What was even more terrifying, as Kiba turned his gaze upon the hospital gate, he was startled to see a line that said, Hospital of the Dead, while the mother taking her son inside. Sensing something spooky was taking place, Kiba quickly drove away. But the man didn't think much about it as his only concern now was to return home as soon as possible. The parking lot was pretty far from his house since it was raining heavily. He had to use the black umbrella that was left in his truck. However, Kiba was a bit hesitant to take it as he remembered it was of the freaky woman and the son. The man wasn't sure if he would use it. A while later, Kiba finally made his decision as he took the umbrella to keep him from getting wet on his way home. Not knowing if it was the strong winds that affected the umbrella, Kiba was constantly being carried away by it. Not only that, while the man was making his way home, out of nowhere a block of wood suddenly fell from above. A loud noise was heard. Kiba could feel something hitting hard on the umbrella yet didn't do any damage to him as the object had bounced off. Kiba fell on the ground while the wood was being thrown to the side. And so was the umbrella. How lucky for Kiba, the umbrella had saved his life. It was a close shave for Kiba as he just got slightly injured arm. Kiba had a hunch that the woman had deliberately left her black umbrella in order for it to save his life. The man couldn't help but tremble as he recalled the nasty incident. The therapist was also filled with fear as he listened to Kiba's story. Kiba pulled on his cigarette then continued with his story. The next morning Kiba drove back to the grocery store. He intended to see the owner and ask him about the woman, as he believed the man must know something about her. Having no other choice, the shop owner had to reveal his secret to Kiba. 
It turned out that the woman and the son were actually spirits. Five years ago on a stormy night the woman was seen walking on the road holding her son. She asked people for a ride to the hospital but no one stopped and helped her. Feeling helpless the woman kept walking. Many cars were seen on the road but no one bothered to stop and help them. There was even a vehicle driving into a muddy puddle and splashed dirty water on the two. The woman used her body to cover her child. However, she had unfortunately slipped and fallen down the cliff. The person who drove the vehicle instantly left the scene after witnessing the whole incident. The woman and the child died afterwards due to excessive bleeding as they hit their heads on rocks while falling down. The old lady, unable to bear with the excruciating pain of losing her daughter and grandson, became crazy shortly after that. Ever since the horrific accident, the villagers usually saw her holding a black umbrella speaking nonsense. And for the one who caused the accident, one day, as he drove past this area, he accidentally hit his car into a house. The man ended up being arrested, also had his involvement with the accident that took the lives of a woman and a child exposed. Those who went to the road in rainy days were likely to see a woman carrying her child while holding an umbrella. If a driver refused to give her a lift to her desired destination, she would mysteriously get into their car and scare them to death. And for that reason no one dared to go to the forest at midnight. After telling Kiba everything he needed to know about the woman, the shop owner suggested him visiting their graves. Kiba then went to their graves. He returned the umbrella to them, then thanked them for saving his life. Thanks to his kindness, the spirits of the woman and the child had saved them from death. Since that day, Kiba always held a belief that ghosts actually existed in real life. This story revolves around the terrifying incidents that took place at a poor village which was located somewhere in the mountainous area of China. The protagonist of the story is a guy named Fong. He was a good looking young man with gentle likeable character and was always hard working. His daily job was to go mushroom picking in the mountains and then traded the mushrooms at the market. One day as usual Fong went to the forest on his own. The continuous rainfall that took place recently had allowed lots of mushrooms to grow. Fong picked the mushrooms, carefully checked them one by one, and then put them in the bamboo basket on his back. Then he made his way deep into the forest. As he was walking, he suddenly smelled a heavy scent. It gently drifted through the forest breeze. Fong was quickly dazzled by the lovely scent. He looked around then decided to follow his nose. The fresh scent led him to go further into the forest. Fong was amazed to find out that the source of this beautiful scent was actually from a wild flower. But this one was different, as it was the first time in his life seeing such a strange looking flower. It looked similar to a lotus bud with small petals that unfolded in circles surrounding the white bud. The flower looked pretty similar to the jasmine since it had thin petals. The pistols in the middle still had nectar on them. The heavy scent released from the flower and the aura surrounding it immediately caught the man's attention. But what amazed him the most was there was only one special flower like this one growing up in the middle of this deserted forest. 
out of curiosity, Fong approached the flower. The flower suddenly gave off strong unpleasant smell that made him cover his nose and step backwards. Later he found out they were large and long roots tightly tying the small flower, as if they were absorbing all the nutrients of the small plant. As he walked along the roots, he saw a bush nearby. He approached it and found out there was something mysterious hiding behind the grooves. Curiously, he grabbed the roots and pulled them out strongly. But there was something heavy affecting them and hence prevented him from doing it. Then the man came up with an idea. He followed the roots to see where they would lead him to. The amazement within him piled up as he realized the thing in front of him was not something in the underground. Actually, it was a pumpkin that had already been withered. From the top of the vegetable appeared a long root. It was also the one that made him curious the whole time. Fong couldn't hide the disappointment mixed with a bit of surprise on his face. He kept staring at the pumpkin and wondered to himself how there could be a pumpkin that grew in such a strange way and how bizarre it seemed to him. Fong walked close to the pumpkin. He realized it had the same size of a watermelon, but there were some dark spots on it that looked like they had been rotten. He carefully checked the pumpkin, then decided to take it home and sell it at the market later, as he assumed he could sell the vegetable at a good price. Or maybe he should show it to the villagers and to find out what type of pumpkin this one was. It wasn't an everyday thing to encounter with a pumpkin like this, hence the man was curious to see what it looked like inside. He put the pumpkin in his basket and then went down the mountain. On his way he was thinking that he would do this to the pumpkin he just found. He kept thinking about it up until he left the dense forest and returned to his village. Fong headed to the market when he showed the pumpkin to the villagers. They quickly gathered round it to take a look of it. They asked where he had wow. found it. Wow. Some was amazed to learn there was a pumpkin this big growing in the forest. They looked at it in amazement. A young man among the crowd suggested to Fong to put it up for auction, but another one told Fong to be careful with the pumpkin. The forest was considered a sacred place, and there was no chance for a pumpkin like this to grow in it. One villager suggested cutting the pumpkin in half to see what was inside it. Fong agreed with the idea. He held a knife in his hands and was about to cut it in the presence of the villagers. Suddenly a male voice came out from behind saying, Stop it! Do not cut the pumpkin! The villagers turned around. It was an old man standing at the end of the queue. Fong was surprised to the man's remark. He asked, Why not cut the pumpkin? The old man spoke in a sacred manner. This spooky pumpkin has been cursed. The villagers talked to each other in a tumult of confusion. What if the old man was speaking the truth? Then Fong had brought bad luck to the villagers. Fong was extremely annoyed by what the old man had told him. He snapped at the man saying what he just said was nonsense. The old man remained calm to Fong's anger. He looked at him and said that the pumpkin was not that normal and harmless as it might seem. Everybody was amazed to hear it. They asked how they could know the pumpkin was not normal. The old man recollected everything. He told the villagers a story that had happened to him years ago. In the old days when the war broke out, the Japanese fascists had brutally killed off people in the forest. They tied up people who opposed them with a long rope and made them line up horizontally in front of the gun barrels. Then the commander would order the soldiers to shoot at them. After the noises of gunshots, blood was seen spilling everywhere. The scene was horrific and terrifying. The souls of those who tragically died at the forest were still there. They turned into blue balls of flame, wandering around the forest, therefore making the atmosphere at the place always gloomy and cold. The souls were sent to a wild flower since they were absorbed into it. The flower was very different from others. It was spooky and ghostly. As time passed by from the spot of the wild flower grew a pumpkin and it was the one that Fong brought home today. Actually they were elsewhere in the forest that had white flowers like it. The villagers were scared as they listened to the old man. Some told Fong not to cut the pumpkin as they believed what he said was true. But the young men in the village didn't think that way. 
They assumed it was just a made-up story of the old man to scare villagers. The contradictory ideas from two sides quickly caused fierce quarrels to break out. The atmosphere started becoming tense and noisy which made Fun extremely annoyed. At that moment the group of young teenagers was behind Fung. They challenged him to cut the pumpkin open. The old man tried to talk him out of doing it. Then he turned around and walked away yet not forgetting to say something before leaving. One day you will regret for what you have done today. The old man's words kept echoing on his mind. He stayed silent and felt bewildered. However, out of curiosity, he decided to cut the pumpkin open. As he reached to a sharp knife, he looked at the pumpkin placed on the wooden cutting board. Without hesitation, the man cut the pumpkin with a great force. It immediately split in half, and a terrifying scene happened before the villagers' eyes. Blood inside the pumpkin splashed everywhere following the cut. The villagers were scared to death to see the scene. There was nothing but blood inside the pumpkin. Blood was spilling everywhere on Fong's body. Some couldn't even stand the fishy smell and had to cover their noses. The villagers blamed everything on Fong. They accused him of bringing ghosts to the village and he had to be held responsible for it. The villagers left after the incident. They left him standing there in bewilderment. That morning, the villagers had been scared out of their wits. They locked the doors as soon as they got home, not daring to go out due to the fear for encountering ghosts. And the horror had happened. That night, Fong couldn't sleep as he felt a burning pain all over his body. Despite not being scratched by anyone, pieces of his skin was peeled off and fell onto the floor. The smell of blood was all over his body. Fong felt itchy and extremely painful. It felt like there was some kind of invisible force slowly torn apart his layers of skin. In just a blink of an eye, the skin on the lower half of his face had been removed. Under the dim light, Fong got off his bed and took heavy steps. Fong was so scared and ashamed of his look. He covered up his face and went to the old man's house asking for his help. He assumed the old man must know something about the white flower and the pumpkin and know how to cure this obscure disease. If the villagers found out about Fong having this rare disease, they would definitely force him to leave the village and this worried him a lot. Fong plucked up his courage, he knocked on the door. A while later, someone finally came out to open the door. The old man gazed at Fong and asked, What's happened? Fong looked at the old man with his soulful eyes, then slowly pulled down the cover on his face, revealing the open sores. He then said it was the pumpkin that caused him to be like that. Seeing the ulcers on his face, the old man couldn't help but be shocked. He stood open-mouthed as he found out it was a pumpkin that caused this. The old man then told Fong to come inside his house. Fong was extremely frightened. He pleaded the old man for help. The old man gazed at Fong in disappointment as he had tried to warn him before, yet he didn't listen to him. He told Fong, Crush the pumpkin into powder, then apply it onto the ulcers. They will heal in two hours. Fong was so happy to know that he could be saved at last, but he soon realized that he had thrown the pumpkin into the river this afternoon. The old man grabbed his flashlight, then told Fong to follow him to the forest for the antidote. He knew where to find a pumpkin that was similar to the one Fong had found. The two set out to the forest at midnight. Fong asked the old man, How could you know so much about that pumpkin? The man told him a story related to the curse of the pumpkin that had happened to him before. When he was young, Yan, his younger brother, had dealt with the same situation. The younger brother was just like Fong. He accidentally found a pumpkin in the forest and then happily brought it home and showed it to the villagers. They gathered around him, amazed at the bizarre pumpkin. Yan happily brought it home as a gift for his wife. That night, he and his wife had small discussion over what to do with the pumpkin. The married couple and their son gathered around the pumpkin. They decided to bring it to the market and sell it for some money. Suddenly, there were knocks outside. The whole family was amazed that it was already late. 
they didn't expect to have a guest coming that late. A middle-aged man formally dressed with a briefcase in his hands came inside. The man introduced his name in a hoarse voice, but there was something unfriendly of him that made the whole family feel wary. The man said he came from the south and offered to buy the pumpkin. Seeing Jan being hesitant about his offer, the man continued by saying that the pumpkin was actually a spiritual one and he was willing to buy it at any price. Jan was thinking for a while. He wondered how the man knew about the pumpkin. The man said it could cure some incurable diseases and was extremely rare. The villagers had told him about the pumpkin and told him to go to Jan's house. Jan asked the man how much money he could pay for the pumpkin. The man raised his five fingers and offered to buy the plant at a high price, one that was beyond Jan's imagination. 500,000 won. Jan was shocked. It was a tremendous amount of money to him. The man convinced Jan to sell the pumpkin to him. He said the pumpkin could have a low value to Jan, but to him it was completely the opposite. A scenario of enormous wealth appeared right before the young man's eyes. The man continued by saying that he would help Jan become the richest man in the village if he agreed to sell the pumpkin to him. But Jan had to take him to the forest and show where the pumpkins like this one were. Of course Jan would earn a high commission for taking the man to the place. Jan didn't hesitate to take the offer. Things happened so smooth that he didn't know what to do except gladly accepting it. But the man wanted to go to the forest right at that moment which amazed the whole family, as it wasn't a good idea to go to the forest in the middle of the night. Jan refused to take him to the forest as he felt uneasy about leaving his wife and son at home this late. So he suggested to wait until the sun came up and then they would set off. But the man said he couldn't wait. He even offered to raise the price for the pumpkin if Jan agreed to take him to the forest immediately. Now Jan couldn't miss this once of a lifetime opportunity. He agreed with the man's offer and said goodbye to his wife and son. Before leaving for the forest, he reminded them to lock the door and told them that he would be back soon. Then Jan and the man set off their journey. With a worrying expression on her face, the wife told Jan to be careful, as it could be dangerous to go to the forest this late. Jan reassured his wife, saying that he would be back home soon. The woman held her child in her arms and gazed at her husband with anxious eyes. She looked insecure as she sensed something mysterious about the man. The two watched Jan and the strange man walking their way to the forest, until their figure faded into darkness. That night, as the woman had lulled the child to sleep, she was still thinking about her husband. The sun had come up, but Jan hadn't returned. Sensing something bad had happened, she told the villagers about the incident and asked them to help her find Jan. The villagers agreed to go to the forest to look for Jan and the mysterious man, as they also believed there was something dangerous and untrustworthy about the man. So they went to the forest. As they had arrived, they split into smaller groups and went to different directions searching for Jan. The villagers called out his name. Their voices resounded throughout the forest, but there was no answer from him. It was until noon when everyone had been tired. A group of young men had witnessed a shockingly terrifying scene. Everyone was freaked out to see the scene before their eyes, as it was so brutal and dreadful. As Jan's wife rushed to the scene, she couldn't hold back her tears, bursted out crying loudly. The mysterious man had killed Jan. His body leaned against a tree, mouth open in fear while the eyes were wide open. The wife rushed to her dead husband, hugged him while crying out in extreme pain. A gloomy atmosphere pervaded the whole forest. The villagers were determined to find the mysterious man to take revenge on him. There was a high chance that he was still in the forest. The villagers separated in smaller groups searching for the man. The intense and furious look was visible on their faces. One villager found a clue about the man. He kept searching. As the man walked for a bit longer, he screamed out loud and fell to the ground as if he had witnessed something truly scary. The other villagers rushed to see what happened. The young man pointed to the place we had just seen the horrors. Everybody was shocked to see the scene before their eyes. The mysterious man had died. He laid next to the tree roots, mouth wide open just like Jan. However, he was still tightly holding the pumpkin that Jan had showed to the villagers. 
The expression on his face was bizarre yet horrifying. By the look of his face, one could easily tell the man had witnessed something truly scary while he was keeping the pumpkin with him. Everyone was freaked out. In just the morning, the villagers had found two dead bodies in the forest. There was a strong likelihood that the man was killed by the ghosts in the forest. The villagers believed it was a fitting punishment for the man as he had previously killed Jan in such a brutal manner. As the old man finishing telling his story, Fong asked him, So what happens after that? Who was the mysterious man? The old man calmly replied, He was a grave robber from the south who specialized in trading spooky things. Fong expressed his amazement. How did you know so well about the pumpkin? The old man then confessed that he was told about its magical uses by his master, but he never truly believed it. These spooky pumpkins could absorb the souls of dead people, Although they could cure many incurable diseases, they were extremely dangerous. The two then reached the end of the forest. At this moment, Fong realized that they had arrived at the spot where he found out about the pumpkin and the white flower. Both Fong and the old man saw the long roots laying on the ground. The old man reached to his pocket and pulled out a knife. He made a cut to one of the roots. From the cut, a white sap oozed out. The old man told Fong to apply the white sap on his face and the ulcers. The old man gazed at the tree roots. He looked worriedly. He believed if the tree roots were still developing, there would be other pumpkins growing in the forest. Then the man suddenly recalled having a book from his master that illustrated a way of removing these tree roots. He didn't expect that one day he would have to use it. The next morning, Fong went to the old man's house. The two carried bamboo baskets that were loaded with yellow powder, which was made by the old man himself. Then they set out to the forest again. As they arrived at the spot, the old man sprinkled the powder on the tree roots. Oddly, as the powder was sprinkled on them, the roots quickly shrunk and became withered. Fong also followed him to do the same. The tree roots altogether withered and died. The old man then took out an incense burner then lit three incense sticks. He made an altar to honor the souls wandering in his forest and also free them. The atmosphere in the forest suddenly became warmer and fresher. The two went down the mountain after finishing their work. In the forest, the tree roots once again were reborn. They wrapped around the big trunks and spouted a white flower. Hello there, I'm currently a college student who also used to work as a part-time shipper. Actually it was my side job working as a shipper. It was pretty tiring and I was weary sometimes, but I earned a pretty good amount of money from it. Whether it was a sunny day or a rainy one, there were always lots of food orders from the customers. Occasionally I had to learn how to deal with my difficult customers or how to greet them appropriately so they could be satisfied and give me a 5 star review. I was pleased with the shipping job and I had no intention of looking for another one until one day. Normally the working time for a shipper isn't fixed. There were days when I finished my work at 11pm but there were also days that I had to work until 2am or even 3am. At night, when there were fewer food orders, the shippers would gather at one particular place, smoking, chatting while waiting for the orders. Normally the topic of the talks would revolve around the freaky customers they encountered or how some restaurant staff had bad attitude towards them. One wouldn't be able to do this job if they didn't have enough stamina and patience. Also, I was chit-chatting with my co-workers when my phone suddenly vibrated. It was a food order from a customer, but the address in it looked kind of strange to me. I asked my two co-workers where the place was, but they had no idea. The location was unclear, 
and it was already at midnight, but since I accidentally accepted the order, I had to say goodbye to my friends and hit the road. But at least I still had Google Maps with me. I didn't feel worried at all as I thought I would easily find the place and quickly return home. Then I drove to the restaurant, bought the food and delivered it to the customer. However, as I was on my way to the address which was displayed on the phone screen, I felt like the distance was way longer than I had expected. The further I drove, the more unlikely I found it that I could find the place. In a moment I realized that I had been outside the city. Feeling annoyed, I wanted to go back, but thinking of the long distance I had driven and the food I had bought, I patiently tried to reach the destination. Behind a row of dense trees appeared a riverbank road and then a forest. But the thing that was worth noticing was, I didn't encounter any single person on my way to the place. Right the moment I wanted to quit, a notification popped up saying I was only 100 meters away from the destination. So I kept driving. I stopped by a large gate. It looked like there was a mansion behind the gate. But there was something really strange with this house. From the front door to the garden, there were no lights in sight. The gate wasn't locked and there was also no doorbell. I made a phone call but no one answered it. So I plucked up all my courage and went inside with a food bag in my hand. I had to turn on a flashlight to navigate my way to the house. How enormous this mansion was. The garden was extremely large that took me forever to find the way to the main door. There were even gusts of cold winds that sent chills down my spine giving me shivers as sweat was dripping down my forehead. Not only that, in the dim light of the flash I discovered something truly frightening. At the end of the garden appeared a cemetery as it slowly emerged from the darkness. The eerie sound of leaves flying in the air made my skin crawl. I started trembling when I saw the graves. The food bag dropped out of my hand and fell onto the ground. I was dumbfounded for a few seconds and quickly ran out of the place as fast as I could. I got on my bike and drove away in horror. The next day I got sick and was bedridden for two days. It was truly the worst time of my life. As I woke up, there were two options that I had to pick one out. One was to continue my shipping job and the other one was to quit and find myself a new job. So after three days, I decided to get back to work, even though I was still not recovered from the incident that had happened to me that night. I told my two co-workers about the bizarre incident. One of them assumed there was a likelihood that one making the order was living at the cemetery, while the other said I had gotten myself involved in some ghostly stuff. They advised me to buy some offerings and burn them to get rid of the bad luck. Although I didn't hold out much hope that this would work, I still did it anyway as it was for my safety. But things didn't get any better. A few days later, another spooky incident happened to me again. That night, I received a food order and the address was at an apartment building where I had once been to. I easily found the building. It was located in the city and took me 7 minutes to reach the destination. However, the building looked pretty old and there were only a few residents who had been living there. The place to which the food had to be delivered was an apartment located on the 7th floor. The building didn't even have elevators as I had to climb up the stairs, but it was still better than navigating the path on the garden of the cemetery that night. I finally found the apartment. As things were going okay, I somehow had a bad premonition. I knocked on the door with my heart beating uncontrollably. Fortunately, a woman opened the door. As soon as she saw me, she confusedly asked who I was and why I came to her place. Fearing that I had come to the wrong address, I took out my phone and checked if it was any mistake, but found none. I had indeed come to the right place. But the woman insisted on not ordering any food. Even her husband constantly affirmed that I had come to the wrong address. I was angry but chose not to say anything as it would violate the company's principles if I irritated the customers. I suddenly remembered there was always a phone number in an order so I pressed call. The phone in the house rang out as soon as I called. 
but soon there was a bewildered expression on them as they said they didn't know where the sound was originating from and even had no idea who had placed the order since there was only two of them in the house. A few seconds later, as if the two had remembered something, their faces changed colour and for me there was like a burning fire in my heart as I was under the impression the two were playing a joke on me. According to the man, the ringtone was similar to that of his father's phone, moreover, it even came out of his room. I was delighted to hear that. I quickly handed the food back to him as we finally knew who was the one who made the order. Could you two please take the food to your father and make a payment for me? But the scared and panicked look on them gave me an impression that things were not as simple as they might seem. As I just finished my sentence, the two turned around and spoke simultaneously. Their father had passed away. I couldn't stay calm, as I thought they were teasing me. With a furious expression on my face, I held at them and demanded them to take the food back. Seeing me behaving aggressively, the man was agitated. The woman had to rush in and stop us from getting into a fight. Eventually, she agreed to pay for the food. After making the payment, the two slammed the door in anger. It was unknown why, but I didn't want to leave immediately, as I just stood in front of the door for a while in bewilderment. Then I accidentally heard part of a conversation from the two freaky customers. Their father had passed away a month ago. His phone had run out of battery and was carefully placed into a drawer in his room so it would be impossible for someone to use his phone and place an order. After listening to their conversation, I quickly ran away in horror. Right the moment I got out of the building, my phone vibrated. Can you believe it? It was the number I previously called that gave me a 5 star review. Later, I gradually got used to dealing with these bizarre incidents and also the freaky customers, but for my safety, I had avoided delivering food at night. I heard this story a long time ago. At one company, workers often worked overtime and left very late to earn extra income. Near 9 o'clock in the evening, a young man named Carol had just finished his shift. Carol was offered a carpool by a colleague, but because the two were not on the same road, Carol refused and intended to take a bus to go home. The factory where the guys worked was in the suburbs and the last bus back to the city left at 9.20 p.m. and arrived at the pickup station around 9.30 p.m. The young man thought he was in time to catch the bus, so when he got out of the factory, the other man drove back first. At this time, the young man looked at his watch. Unexpectedly, it was almost half past nine. Carol knew he could be late, so he rushed to the nearest bus stop. The bus stop was a few minutes by motorbike from the factory. He had to run at full speed to get to the station. When he got there, he was almost out of breath, panting. The young man looked at his watch once again, in a worried expression about afraid of not being on time. Unfortunately, the clock struck 9.40pm, meaning the last bus left the station more than 10 minutes ago. The way back to the city also became longer because it was difficult to catch a car here. Carol was disappointed. He had missed the last bus. He thought about having to take a taxi back to the city and worried about money. While Carol was thinking that, a bus arrived. When the bus arrived, Carol was overjoyed, thinking that the bus was late as he was. This might have been the only exception ever. It could also be considered as Carol's luck. The bus creaked to a stop in front of Carol. Because Carol often rode the bus at the hour, he recognized the familiar driver at a glance. What was strange was that there were so many people on the bus. Normally, at this time of day, only about one or two passengers would be there. This was even more crowded than usual. 
Only one person on the bus had been following Carol's every move since he got onto it. It was a middle-aged man whose expression changed when he saw Carol. Not paying any attention to this, Carol slowly found an empty seat near the back of the bus and sat down. The man was still staring at Carol and thinking about something. To avoid the angry look, Carol purposely turned his head toward the window and looked down. Unexpectedly, the man stood up and went straight to where Carol was sitting. He approached without a word and a hostile look on his face like Carol had done something wrong with him. Moments later, the man suddenly swung his fist and punched Carol's face. Unable to take it anymore, Carol angrily stood up and argued with the man. He wondered why he hit people like that. Carol didn't have time to say anything when the man ferociously grabbed him by the collar and wanted to drag him out of the bus because he was not pleasing to the eye. He didn't understand what was happening. He just wanted to push the man away, but he couldn't. He begged the people on the bus to help him. But none of the people on the bus would speak up, as if they could neither see Carol nor know what was happening on that bus. Then the man pulled Carol to the front of the bus while he was shouting that he needed to get out of the bus urgently. Despite Carol protesting, the man kept asking him to get off the bus. The driver did not say anything in motion for the bus to stop. At this time, the bus door was also open. Immediately, the man pulled Carol out of the bus without once looking back at him. The bus door quickly slammed shut and the bus continued to move. When the bus drove away, the middle-aged man let go of his hand and watched as the bus was slowly disappearing. Suddenly, he sighed, his face drenched with sweat. He suddenly changed his expression and told Carol that he was scared to death just now. Carol froze in place, thinking the man was losing his mind, so he acted like that. This man saw a suspicious and confused look on Carol, so he told him that they were riding on a ghost bus. The man also recounted the process of getting on this bus. Once settled into position, he sensed that something was wrong. The first was that the people on the bus were all lifeless, not talking or breathing. He immediately looked around to examine the situation. The bad luck was that he discovered that all the passengers on the bus had no legs. Only then did he realize that they were not human at all. He was afraid to make a sound and didn't know what to do until he saw Carol getting onto the bus. He realized Carol was a real person, alive. So he had to think of a way for both of them to get off of the bus. The man made it clear to Carol and told him to hurry home. Carol thought the man didn't look like a madman lying. By that time there were no more buses so he decided to take a taxi to go home. When he got into the taxi, Carol and the driver accidentally heard the news broadcast on FM radio that the police had found a bus which jumped off the bridge and fell into the river at 4pm. The news reached his ears, sending chills down his spine. Soon after, Information about the bus was made clear. All nine passengers and the driver died. What was even more bizarre was that it was the same bus that Carol was on.